Oh, next travel to a town, even Johnny Carson would be careful about asking too many questions at first. It's Dry Prong. This little community on the edge of the Kasachi National Forest started along a small creek. There's one problem with the creek. It had a tendency to dry up during the summertime. Dry Prong, Louisiana is a small village located just off of Highway 167 in the middle of Grant Parish. But Dry Prong did not always exist here. It actually began about two miles away. For that bit of history, we head into the forest with longtime resident and former mayor, Glenn Maxwell. So Glenn, this is the original town of Dry Prong. We're standing <laughs> right in the original. You can't get any more Dry Prong than this because we're standing right on top of what was the actual mill, grist mill, that was the, uh, uh, that was the foundation of this community. How did Dry Prong get its name? Dry Prong got its name when some people came in here, oh, I guess before the turn of the 20th century, and uh, uh, they were looking for a place to actually put a mill. And back in those days, everybody lived on creeks and, uh, uh, and knew where the creeks were. Well, this little creek here was a, actually a prong off of Big Creek. And it was called the Dry Prong because in the summertime, it would actually, it wouldn't get completely dry, but it would go down to where it really wasn't usable for people in those days for any kind of industry. Glenn says this is part of what used to be called Hannigan's Mill, and it was deliberately built on this dry prong because a foundation to the mill could be built in the summertime. What we're walking over is part of the old mill? Actually, we're walking over the actual foundation of the mill. Really? Uh, if we don't fall off of this log here, <laughs> well, if right. I do, I'll fall right in the middle of the mill. Uh, but right here where my stick is at, uh -huh. that is actual, an actual timber of the mill. And it's just as solid today as it was the day that it was put in. I'm going to get off this log before I fall off of it. Good luck with that, and now I'll try it my best as well. <laughs> it's a slippery piece of wood here, Glenn. <laughs> that it is. <laughs> How large of a mill are we talking about? Actually, these mills were not that big. Uh, you see them in the magazines and the uh, old history books and whatnot, and you see these massive structures. But that wasn't the case. Uh, there were a lot of mills up here on these little creeks. Mm -hmm. Every little community pretty much had one of some sort. So as far as this physical size, it wasn't that big. I would imagine a water wheel was probably... 10 foot high, something like that. Just up about 20 feet from the creek, the mill maker created a man-made pond to power the water wheel. So what he did, he came in, as you can see, the remnants of the old dam right through here. We're basically well, in the what used to be the pond, huh? We're actually standing in the old pond. And of course, when you look out across there, you can tell uh, from all the cypress trees that this was uh, some type of a, of, a, of a very wet area. You know, as the water went down during the course of the day, if it got too low at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, they just shut things down, went home, and waited until <laughs> the next morning, and came back and started to work again. And these mills were multi-purpose mills? Yes, very much so. What types of uses? They were used for, well, they have a sawmill uh, used for them, a, a grist mill, a syrup mill. They could go in and change the, uh, the equipment that they needed. Long before Hennigan's Mill, this area was inhabited by Native Americans. We're just touching the surface on the people here in Dry Prong because the, uh, out of an area just uh, this part of the Dry Prong community, we uh, brought artifacts out of there that dated back to really the beginning of recorded history. And uh, I had them dated by the state archaeologist, the federal archaeologist, and uh, Dr. Gregory at Northwestern State University. So when the people came in, they came in to where the Indians were already living. Of course, as you know the story of the Indians. They moved them out in 1890, 1900 back to Oklahoma. So they virtually disappeared overnight. Ironically, so did the residents of Dry Prong about 50 years later. Due to World War II, this area became an enormous training facility for the Army that took up tens of thousands of acres. Glenn, you grew up in these hills. Yeah, I've been here all my life. Has it always looked like this? These uh, beautiful no, no, pine no. trees? No, in the early days, it was nothing but sage grass, blackjack oaks, scrub oaks. Uh, this looked like a World War I bombed out battlefield. In fact, you still need to watch your step throughout the pines. Signs still warn of unexploded shells in some areas. Glenn, inside the Kasachi National Forest is what? What is this? Well, this is an old bunker left over World War II. This was, uh, we're in the middle of, a, of one of the ranges out here uh -huh. where they were using uh, live ammunition 
uh, primarily on this particular range, it was a lot of small arms. And what we have right here is a, a storage area for a little train that uh, pulled targets around a range up here that targets stuck up above the uh, range and the, the men with the soldiers with the, the rifles or M1s or machine guns, carbines and whatnot could fire on those targets. And uh, it helped them uh, learn how to shoot a moving target. And there's still up there remnants of uh, the old uh, foxholes where the men would crawl by and live explosions, explosives would be going off beside them so that they would get the feel of what war was all about. Back in the current village of Dry Prong, there is another remnant of the war, the Garlington Memorial Gymnasium. It was originally built south of Alexandria in Camp Claiborne. After the war, it was taken down board by board and rebuilt in Dry Prong, some 50 miles away, and served as the town's high school gym. By the time the LNA Railroad made its way through town in 1906, Dry Prong's original site moved to its current location. You see right here? But whether you talk about Dry Prong of the present or the past, some things don't seem to change. There was probably 150 people, 125 people that lived around here, but all the social activities and whatnot, everything took place around this mill. So thanks to the efforts of people like Glenn Maxwell, our time travel guide, folks in this area can appreciate the many lives of Dry Prong.